Let's pray. God, that's my prayer tonight, that you would consume me, consume us from the inside out, that we would be all about you, Lord. Like Jesus, when his parents thought they had lost him, found him, he said, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? May that be said of us, Lord. God, tonight I pray that you would increase our desires for you, your presence in our lives, that we would want nothing else but to be in the arms of our dear Savior, consumed by you, Lord. Be with us now as we open your word. I pray that you would be with us in the reading of your word. You would bless it, that you would use it to change lives, that it would not return void to you tonight, as your word promises that it will not. Be with us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, good to see you. Someone before the service told me Dan's not here, so we can do whatever we want. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Turn your Bibles to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. That's the second book of the Bible there after Genesis, if you haven't picked up a Bible much. So Exodus chapter 33. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, desiring the presence of God, desiring God, desiring the presence of God. Um, that is the extent of my introduction. So let's get into uh, the text. Okay, Exodus 33, verses 15 and 16. We'll read the verses and I'll give you some background of what led up to Moses saying this. And then we'll get on with the business. 15 and 16. And he said to him, so Moses said to God, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? These are powerful words from Moses here, and we're going to get to uh, their power here in a minute, but I want to catch you up on what's going on so we can get the full weight of them. At this point in Israel's journey out of Egypt, they've been traveling for about a year, okay? Um, they've been traveling for a year, and they've had ups and downs. They're just like any other uh, normal followers of God at that point, and at this point, they're like us a lot. They've had Really good times, and they've had really bad times. Um, a, a really good time was when they crossed the Red Sea. So you think, well, that wouldn't have been hard to do. God split the Red Sea. You just walked through it, right? Do you understand how crazy that would have been to have massive walls of water? I can understand going like 15 feet so I can still get back if they come crashing down. But you get to the middle where that side is as far as where you came from, that's terrifying. I mean, I've never experienced that, but I could imagine massive walls of water on either side, and they actually had faith to walk through. So that's a really good moment for the Israelites, right? We commend them on that. But they have really bizarre things that they do. Like, they don't listen to God very well other times. There was a time where they really wanted some food because they're out in the wilderness. In Exodus uh, 16, you know about God raining down manna from heaven. He says this, look, six days you're going to collect manna. Six days, you're going to go out and you're going to collect it. On the sixth day, though, you're going to collect twice as much. So the other five days, you're collecting just what you need for the day. On the sixth day, you're going to collect twice as much. Because on the Sabbath, we don't work. On the Sabbath, we don't go out and collect bread. So don't go out there and look for bread because there's not going to be any bread. All right? And lo and behold, what, does, what happens? The next verse, let me just read it for you. Exodus 16, 27 says this. On the seventh day, some of the people went out together, but they found none. Okay, so they got really good moments of crossing through the Red Sea. Then they got really like, what are you thinking? God must be thinking, what on earth? I just told you, don't go out on the seventh day. There's no bread there. But some of them went. Can, we can amen that, right? Amen. Maybe you're sitting by someone who is like that. Uh, who knows? Um, <laughs> let me give you an example. Here's how you can know. There's signs outside that say no drink or food in the sanctuary. Just look around, okay? Maybe, uh, anyways. Um, that's just one way. We're not condemning you, but there is a sign. Okay. Um, and that's what God, God said, look, six day. Okay. Anyways, we're going to move on. 
Okay, so they have really good moments and they have really bad moments. It's just like us, right? We can't hate on them too much because we have really good days, really good seasons of following God, and we have really bad seasons sometimes. Uh, and then in Exodus 32, something that we've talked about about a year ago in the life of Moses here in the service, uh, Exodus 32, they do something really, really bad. Moses has gone up to commune with God, to get instructions from God for 40 days up on Mount Sinai. And at some point during that time, the people start getting antsy and they don't know what's happened to Moses and they need something tangible to worship. They have gone far too long without any guidance from God. They haven't heard from Moses. Okay, they're medium between God and them and they're getting antsy. And so they tell uh, Aaron, Moses' brother, to get up and make them a God, okay? Because we don't know what's happened to that Moses fellow who brought us out of Egypt. I kid you not, that's what it says in Exodus 32. We don't know what's become of Moses. And so Aaron, because he's kind of codependent and he wants people to like him, he says, okay, we'll do it. I know we shouldn't do this, but we'll do it. Everyone give me your gold and I will make a calf. So they all give him the gold. He puts it in the fire and he fashions a golden calf. And the calf comes out and they start to worship. If They start to have this massive worship gathering around this golden calf. Um, we can't knock them too much because that's what they would do back then, okay? Uh, if they wanted to worship their God, they'd make a carved image. They'd make something that symbolized them and then they would worship that. But here's the problem with that. That'll work for all your other puny gods who don't even exist. But for the God of the universe, no carved image can uh, fully resemble all that he is, how glorious he is. So this is a big mistake. So we can kind of see what they're doing, but it's still a big mistake on their part. And that's why God said, look, don't make any carved images. That's the second commandment, because he cannot be fit into one of that uh, examples of his creation. So Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. Remember, I'm giving you all the background up to our verses. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and he hears the gathering going on. He hears what's going on, and um, he, he goes berserk, basically. He breaks the commandments, the, the two tablets that God just spent 40 days engraving, all right? He breaks those, and then he starts questioning Aaron. Aaron, um, lies to him, says, look, I don't know what happened. We put all the gold in the fire, and then a calf came out. It was crazy. That's what it says. I kid you not. Okay, Exodus 32. Not in those exact words, but he, he totally said, look, these people, they're crazy. They made, we just did it, and, and out it came, and uh, who knows, right? Moses isn't having it, and so he says, who is with God? Who is going to side with God in this? And he tells all the Levites to grab swords, and he tells them to start mowing men down, basically. They kill 3,000 men that day. And then God says, uh, or God brings a plague on the people because they worshiped the golden calf. There's always consequences for our sins. And then on top of all of that, God says, okay, Moses, it's time for us to go to the promised land. It's time for us to go, but here's the deal. I'm not going with you. I'm not going to go with you anymore. See, because if I went with you, I would consume every single one of you because you are a stiff-necked people. That's what God says. And so think about how Moses is feeling and how the people are feeling. Exodus 33 tells us how they're feeling. They are distraught. They are mourning. They don't put on their ornaments that day um, and if they had them on, they took them off. The God who has gotten them out of Egypt, who supplied all of their needs, who allowed them to cross through the Red Sea, who gave them food and water, who is going to protect them from their enemies, who is the great and merciful God, slow to anger, is not going to be with them anymore. Um, what does Moses do in this moment? Well, let me read our text again. And then we'll, we're going to zoom back in and, and bring it into focus. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And so... Um, Moses does the Christian thing to do, right? What, which we all would say, yeah, we'd do that. He says, you know what, God? I don't want to go if you're not going. I don't want to go if you're not going. And I believe that Moses was sincere in this. And we've said it a lot. We give lip service to God so much. Like, I'm not going if God's not going to go there. But so many times our actions in, lives don't, in our lives don't line up with our words. Let me paint the picture a little better for you. Um, 
They had just committed a grievous sin. Have you ever been around um, a situation where either you made a big mistake, a grievous sin, or someone around you did? And you sense that shame and that guilt and maybe that filthiness, right? Even if you didn't have anything to do with the sin. Because that's what sin does. It brings on destruction and decay. And it makes things terrible. Have you ever been in that type of situation? The pervading, or, uh, yeah, the pervading feeling there is, get me out of this. Get me out of this situation. Moses surely had to be thinking about something like that. And then remember, 3,000 people were just killed. I don't know what they did with them, but 3,000 people kill, being killed by the, by, the, uh, by the sword, my guess is that it's a pretty gruesome sight that day in the camp, around the camp. My guess is there's a smell in the air. You contrast all of that with the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. You might say, I don't even like milk, so why does that sound so great? Well, let me explain. I don't like milk, so maybe you're like me. Um, flowing with milk and honey. What does that mean? The flowing part means abundance, an abounding of what? Well, nutrition and pleasure, right? Milk and honey. And so what God is saying is that the promised land is going to be flowing with milk and honey. This is going to be a great place. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to protect you from all the people. And so Moses has got that on one side, this beautiful promised land, and then this other situation here. And he says, if you're not going with me, though, I won't go. I will not go if you're not going to go with me. And this is where the stakes start getting raised in our life. We're talking about the presence of God. Um, This is where we start talking about worship. This is where we start figuring out, are you going to worship creator God or are you going to worship creation? Are you going to worship the gift or the giver or are you going to worship his gifts? This is one of the most important questions you can ask yourself. What is most valuable to you in your life? What is most valuable to you in your life? Is God your supreme treasure or is comfort or wealth or peace of mind or some other good gift? And they are good gifts, but the problem is a good thing becomes a bad thing when you make it an ultimate thing. Okay? A good thing becomes a bad thing when you make it an ultimate thing. No created idea or person or being or thing should take precedence over creator God. And so Moses looks at this decision. Moses is seen clearly here. He looks at it. He says, Father, if you're not going with me, then I don't want to go. He desired the presence of God over the gifts of God. He looks prosperity and a way out of this horrible mess that they find themselves in. He looks those things in the eye and he says, I don't want it if God's not going with me. So let's bring that into today's terms, right? I don't want the better paying job if God doesn't go with me. I don't want to move if God isn't going with me. I don't want the fame if God doesn't bless it. I don't want to marry this person if God says it isn't right. I don't want to preach the sermon if God isn't in it. The biggest factor in our lives, in decisions, in um, looking ahead is this. Will God be there? Will he be there? Because if he's not going to be there, then we shouldn't want to go. Moses says, look, I'd rather stay out here in the desert eating quail and manna and dealing with this nasty situation, this grievous sin that our people have committed. I'd rather stay out here, if you're going to be here, God, than go to that wonderful promised land if you're not going to be there. I wonder if this is our response to God, the presence of God. You see, here's what Moses wanted. This is so incredible to me. Look at verse, uh, halfway through verse 16. He says, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? Here's what I find so often in my life, for sure, and then a lot of Christians' lives, is that we're not trying to look distinct. We are trying to fit in as best as possible. We are trying to not cause any ripples in the world. We are trying to fit in. And here Moses is saying, I don't want to go because if you're not with me, then I'm not distinct. So many times, so many churches have sold out and just started doing all sorts of crazy things. Why? So that we could look more like the world. That's not the point. The point is to be distinct. To be with God is to be distinct. To not be with God is to blend in. Are you distinct or do you blend in? 
That's what we have to ask ourselves. Are you distinct or do you just blend in? I want to look at four factors. Four factors from uh, this story and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done. Maybe five factors. We'll see. Number one, I have to ask the question and maybe you're asking it already. How did he do it? How did he do it? Okay, so maybe it doesn't seem like that big of a decision. Maybe I painted a horrible picture for you. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully the Holy Spirit helps you. But for me... To, to choose between that desert, that filthy place of wandering and, and quail and manna nonstop. Like, I'm a creature of habit. I'll eat the same thing a lot, but, man, quail and manna for a year? I don't know about that. So you contrast that with uh, the promised land? Man, that's, that seems like a really difficult thing to do. How did he do it? See, because here's the deal, prosperity, prosperity, the promised land, is a dangerous gift. Here's what I know. Um, Most Christians will survive uh, adversity. Most of us will survive adversity. Few of us will survive prosperity. Did you hear that? Most of you will survive adversity, but few of you will survive prosperity. It is a dangerous, intoxicating gift. So how did Moses do it? How did he look all that promised land greatness in the face and say, no, I don't want to go if you're not with me, God. Here's how. Past obedience helps with present temptation. What do I mean by that? Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. Don't turn there. We've got it on the screen. We will have it on the screen. Amen. Okay. Past obedience helps with present temptation. Listen to this. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ministered, or mistreated, sorry, with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking forward to the reward. How did Moses do it? He had a lot of practice in already making this decision before. He had done it many years ago in Egypt. He turned away all the wealth that could have come from him, or for him, from being part of Pharaoh's family. He turned away from it uh, to instead be with Christ and his people because he was looking towards the reward. And so what is the spiritual point here? The point is that you're going to be able to defeat big temptations in your life by defeating a million little ones before you get to that big one. You follow me? So here's how it usually happens. Something will happen with someone in the church and everyone will think, oh my gosh, we never saw that coming. But it never happens like that. Massive sin never happens in a vacuum. They were saying yes to sin, little sins, all along the way and they got to a huge moment in their life and they did not have the power to say no. Right? That's what happens. It's never just, oh, Something happened and, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. No, it's a slow and steady go. The choices that we make today will impact our future for better or worse. We strengthen our reservoir of resistance to sin by saying no to sin a million times a day. It's those little things that matter. We think they don't matter, but they do. Young people, you guys are the biggest... um, I guess, target that, that Satan has. You think that the decisions you don't make today are going to affect you? They absolutely will. You have no other option. You have no other option. What you reap, you will sow. Or what you sow, you will reap. Or whatever. I don't remember. Okay, let's get to the second point. You might be thinking now, does it always, is it, what, does it always have to come down to comfort or God? Does it always have to come down to prosperity or God? Does it always have to come down to, oh, you can either be wealthy or you can be a Christian? Look, no, it doesn't. It doesn't always come down to that, all right? The truth is that if God is first in your life, then you're going to feel blessed and on top of the world regardless of what you do or don't have. That's the truth. But the great thing about God is that he is so gracious to give you great gifts in life. And so is God enough for all of your desires? Yes. But does he shower his children with blessings on top of himself? Yes, he does. And as long as you keep him preeminent in your affections, 
utmost in your affections, then things will go well with you. Put anything above him, and things start to go haywire really quick. So it doesn't always have to be comfort or God. You just got to be careful which one's first. Um, and it's not just comfort or prosperity. It's just decision making. Like, who runs your life? Does God or do you? Do you consult him? For daily things, we'll get to that here in a minute. Our third point is this, um, and we kind of made it earlier, but we'll make it again. However great God's blessings are in life, it's still better to be with God in the desert, surrounded by 3,000 rotting corpses, than to be in the promised land without God. That's, that is the truth from the text. It is better to be in that desert, in that sticky situation, that that terrible situation of that grievous sin, if you got God, than to be in the promised land with all the prosperity without Him. Does your life line up with that? Is God truly the greatest good? Would you live anywhere, work anywhere, die anywhere, serve in any way if you could only have God? If you could just have God? Or do you put other conditions on it? Is it, God, I'll move here if this? Where the question should be, God, if you're there, I'll be there. Sign me up. When are we going? That's what the question should be. Our fourth and last point, uh, maybe, uh, is uh, this. This is going to sound cheesy, but bear with me. The presence of God is not acquired in a microwave, but a crock pot. All right? So young people are like, what's a crock pot? Okay. That's okay. Look, get with an older person, tell them what Twitter is, and they can tell you what a crock pot is, okay? <laughs> All right. We can do that. We can just exchange ideas here. The presence of God is not acquired in a microwave, but rather in a crock pot. You know how to, the, to get or to desire more of the presence of God? You spend time in the presence of God. Let me tell you, it, uh, let me make that statement in a negative uh, way or from a, the opposite side it's incredible how much I don't care about sports once I quit watching them right Look, I haven't watched uh, college basketball in a few years I don't give a rip who won this year I don't care I guarantee you, though if I got cable and started watching it again my gosh I'd have the bracket filled out and I'd be tearing my hair out and watching all the games if you want to desire the presence of God more be in the presence of God more that's how it works. It's the laws of nature and the laws of spirituality. It's like uh, you can't win a marathon if you never practice running. And you're never going to experience the presence of God if you don't spend time in it. Okay? Um, I told the kids this last week, if you want the appetite for Scripture, a greater appetite for Scripture, then uh, read Scripture more. It's very simple. Okay? Moses communed with God so much. Right before this, right before he said this, right? Right before he said, God, I don't want to go to the promised land if you're not going to be there with me. He spent 40 days with God up on the mountain. 40 days with him. And later in the book of Exodus, it says that Moses started being with God so much in the tent of meeting and meeting with him face to face so much that when he'd come out, his face would just shine. I want my face to shine. But it's not going to shine if I don't ever get face to face with the light who is God. You got to spend time with God. The more you do, the more you desire. Let me give you an example here of how important the presence of God is. In Leviticus chapter 8, right? You're like, what book is that? Okay. It's the third book in the Bible, and it is crazy, I understand, but it's a really cool book. In Leviticus 8, we learn about priests being consecrated for their priestly work. And they start their ordination. And God says to tell Moses, to tell the priests, he says, Look, uh, once they're in the tent of meeting, they can't come out for seven days until their ordination is complete. You think, my gosh, you stick seven or a bunch of priests in a tent together for seven days? They must have stunk. Okay? But uh, there's a point here. Most people, we have prayer time for like 10 minutes in the morning. It's like, God, I'm going. I hope you catch on to my coattail. I'll pray, but I hope you're with me. Uh, And here they are for seven days 
praying here and meeting with God until the time of their ordination is done. Why? Because God's work is super important and you are doomed if he is not with you in it. You think, okay, Jordan, uh, none of us are priests. Why are you telling us this? Wrong. You are priests. Read 1 Peter 2, 5, where Peter calls you a royal priesthood. You say, well, okay, but I don't do God's work. Wrong. You do do God's work. Or maybe you don't. I don't know what you're doing. You should be doing God's work. It's your job. You'll be held accountable for it one day. All the works that don't, that will not survive the fire one day will be torched like stubble and straw. But all the things that last, all the good works, Paul says in Corinthians, they will last, they will survive the fire. You are a priest. You are doing God's work. The only question is, is God with you? Is the presence of God with you? We are all priests. And here's what I'll tell you. <laughs> you should shake in your boots at the thought of, not, of God not going with you. I'll be honest. It terrifies me to get up here and have a feeling like the Holy Spirit's not with me. What on earth do I have to tell you people without his help? Are you kidding me? I don't even have a master's degree. Some of you are like, what? He doesn't? <laughs> okay. Um, seriously, though, it terrifies me to stand up here. And sometimes I'll finish and I'll be like, oh, that was me. That was all Jordan. Gosh, it's terrible. Oh, man, if God doesn't go with us, we're nothing. We are absolutely nothing. We've done nothing. We've played a game if God isn't with us here tonight. What happens when we wait? If you're a curious person like me, you want to know, well, what happens if I wait? Well, here's the cool thing. That was from Leviticus 8, the priest story. And then in Leviticus 9, uh, the Bible tells us that they came out at the end of seven days where they had communed with God. And God, the glory of God, came and was among the people. And they fell, they shouted, and they fell on their faces praising God. That's what happens when you spend time with God. Crazy things start happening. You see, uh, you don't have to fabricate them anymore. You don't have to jump around and raise your hand and, oh man, I'm so spiritual, I love God, a bunch of hoopla nonsense. You don't have to fabricate it anymore because he shows up, people know. They spent seven days with God and they came out of there and the glory of God showed up and revival happened in the people of Israel. If that's not happening in our lives, well, the, the, uh, the probability is that we left God at home this morning. And many of us will leave him at home tomorrow morning, work out things on our own strength. There's all sorts of ways you can summarize the Bible. Um, the main way that I would like to do it is uh, God's big, you're not. If you want to have any meaning or purpose in life, stick with him. God can get it done, you can't. He's big, you're small. The whole story of the Bible is that you can't get it done, right? Jonah 2.9, salvation belongs to the Lord, not to Jordan. That's the story of the Bible, is that you are weak, he is strong, you side with him, you're strong. We can't leave God by the bedside in the morning. If the presence of God doesn't go with us, then we are nothing. No, no sermon preached, no song sung, no Bible study had, no hot meal served or mission trip traveled to will amount to even one salvation if God wasn't among it. No real salvation, at least. No salvation that matters. Is he with you daily? Moses saw it clearly. Can we see it clearly? I want to add one more thing before we end. Um, if a sermon doesn't ever get around to how God is the answer, kind of like I just said, to, a way to summarize the Bible, then just ignore the sermon, okay? I'll give you, uh, I, I believe that that's God's words there. If a, if a sermon never gets around to showing us how Jesus is the answer, how God himself is the answer, tune it out. Tune me out. And so, 
the reason I say that is for you to desire the presence of God more, that is not something that comes naturally to you. Okay? So, before you were a child of God, that did not exist in you. God did not come to make your existing desires better or more holy. This is super important. You've got to hear this. God, or Jesus, did not come to make your already existing uh, desires more holy. He came to give you a whole new set of desires. That's what it means to be born again. The old desires are gone, and the new desires have shown up. So, to, ha- to even have a desire for the presence of God, you must be born again. It's not that you try harder. Okay, anytime you do a sermon on telling people to get in the Word more, it, it feels like, okay, well, we just got to try harder. We got to wake up earlier. We got to read longer, whatever. Well, you do got to do all those things, but that's not what's going to usher in, um, usher you into the presence of God. It's the power of, of God and the Holy Spirit through you. He has to give you those new desires, and He has to reawaken them every morning. You ever wonder why Lamentations 3 says that your mercies are new every morning? Why does He have to say that? Man, because we need them every morning. It's not that you're being saved every morning again. But you need to be reminded, oh yeah, I've got new desires. I've got to spend time cultivating them. Spend time growing them through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I didn't want you to leave here tonight thinking, okay, I'm going to try harder. I'm just going to try harder. Don't, please don't. All right, that's not the answer. The answer is to get even more weak. Rely even more on the strong one. Rely even more on God. Let's pray. God, so many times we we just start, we get in this habit of doing things for for, uh, purposes other than uh, your glory, other than your satisfaction, other than your approval. God, we do it for other people. We do it to, to, um, to raise ourselves in, in the eyes of the world, to elevate ourselves, God. We do it for friends or we do it um, because it makes us feel good, God. We do it for so many wrong reasons. God, here, right now, we're about to stand to sing and some people will stand and they don't have a clue why we're doing this. They're just mouthing the words, making sure they look okay to everyone around them, and they'll consider that a good evening. But God, if you're not with us, if you're not the object of our desires, our affections, if you're not the goal, if your glory is not our main objective, then we've failed. We're playing a game, and we are most to be pitied. Oh, God, that you would wake a desire in this church for your presence. We wouldn't be after the perfect service or the perfect sermon or the perfect song or a ton of people in the pews or a lively bunch of people. We wouldn't care about any of that as long as we knew in our hearts that you were there. You were there. God, help me desire that. Awaken that desire again in my heart. As we sing now, oh, that you would be our audience and no one else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us, we're going to sing one more song. Hey, we want to meet God here, okay? So maybe you wasted the first five songs. Okay, look, that's in the past. Let's make the most of this song. Make the most of this time being face-to-face with your Creator. The altar is open. You can come meet with Him here. You can pray with a friend. You can come talk or pray with me. I don't care what you do. Just meet with God. Put everything else aside and meet with Him. If you don't have His presence, you have nothing. Nothing.